Great to be with you. Well, I'm this way once again. We've arrived in November now. And if you were out and about in Bewley today, you certainly need no reminder of that. Well, more importantly, we all seem to be arriving into times where the whole world seems to be increasingly cold and dark, overshadowed by trouble and fear and suffering. So perhaps it's more important than ever for us to keep on returning to that ancient source of faith and hope, the things we all need so much. We're going to do that now. So come on, let's worship God. Perhaps you'll say with me the words in yellow. As winter gets closer, may we still draw near to you. As the leaves turn golden, may we still turn toward you. As the days darken, may you always be our light. Shall we pray? Eternal One, our Heavenly Father and our earthly friend, we gather 
before you now, in the peace and stillness which we enjoy where we are, to worship you and to reflect something of your glory as we rejoice in what we know of your love. In your presence we are all united as one. We may be in different places, facing different circumstances and situations. Some of us may have come before you often in this way and others not, but all of us together are embraced in those arms of your welcome as you offer us a glimpse of your glory. In the face of such powerful love and such overwhelming generosity, we can only be humble and thankful and joyful. We confess that often and in many ways, we fail to live in a way that's worthy of all that you give us as we live lives that are small and selfish, lives which reflect our anxieties rather than your glory. So again, we come to place our trust in the power of your grace, that it may change us and lead us and inspire us, that our gratitude may extend beyond these moments to shape all our attitudes, all our priorities. So hear us as we pray together in those words once taught by Jesus. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Words. Well, I've used a lot of them already, haven't I? They can be incredibly useful. What a fantastic tool we have to communicate with each other. My goodness, it's hard to imagine what life would be like if we didn't have words. We use a lot of them. Many people who do my job probably use far too many of them. Yet, even when we all speak the same language, when we all use the same words, we don't always understand things in the same way. A teacher once asked her class if they could use the word fascinate in a sentence. Well, one girl put her hand up and said, I went to my grandest farm and he showed me all his sheep. It was fascinating. Well, the teacher said, that's good, but the word I'm wanting you to use is fascinate, not fascinating. Anyone else? Well, another girl put up her hand. She said, but well, my granddad took me to see a museum and I was fascinated. Well, the teacher said, that's good as well. I'm glad to hear that, but I really want to hear the word fascinate. Mm, little Johnny put his hand up then. The teacher hesitated because she had problems with his stories before, but surely there was no way he could say anything hurtful with the word fascinate. So she called on him. Johnny said, my granda has a favourite old cardigan. It has ten buttons, but now he's grown so fat that he can only fasten eight. <laughs> Teacher apparently sat down and quietly cried. You see, we use so many words each and every day. We hear, we read so many words each and every day. You would have thought with all these words, the world by now would be so full of understanding and wisdom, yet even with the most advanced communication technology the world has ever known, we still don't seem to have much of that wisdom. We still don't seem to be able to understand each other. So we're going to come now again to hear some special words, some words that have been read and heard and said very often over many years. May we find something in them to be fascinated by. May we find something fascinating in them and perhaps something that might fascinate us for a long time to come. Listen now for the gospel. Alleluia. It is God's word that changes us. Alleluia. Listen now for the gospel. Alleluia. It is God's word that changes us. Alleluia. When misunderstandings, when mistrust develop in churches, it's usually a good idea if the leaders can sit down and talk it over with people to 
explain, to listen. But when you're a traveling leader like Paul, that's just not going to be possible. So when he hears news of such troubles, such criticism of his leadership, he sets out to explain in the form of a letter, which gives us the advantage of being able to share that wisdom ourselves. Behind his response, we can sort of guess at what the criticisms must have been. Some complaining that he didn't devote himself full time to his work because he insisted on earning his own income from tent making. Others complained he was just using the church, he had no real interest in them. So Paul defends his actions. He assures them of his strong interest in them. We read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work among you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus Christ and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. It's not often that we find Jesus speaking harsh, condemning words, and when we do, almost invariably those words are addressed to the religious, self-righteous types, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in particular. We get that again now. We read from Matthew chapter 23, beginning at the first verse. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law, so you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. They tie onto people's backs loads that are heavy and hard to carry, yet they aren't willing to lift even a finger to help them carry those loads. They do everything so that people will see them. Look at the straps with scripture verses on them, which they wear on their foreheads and arms. And notice how large they are. Notice also how long are the tassels on their cloaks. They love the best places at feasts and the reserved seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called teacher. You must not be called teacher because you're all brothers of one another and have only one teacher. And you must not call anyone here on earth father because you only have one father in heaven. Nor should you be called leader because your one and only leader is the Messiah. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever makes himself great will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be made great.
We thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God. Now, here's an interesting thing. I know it's usually a bad sign when a minister begins like that because, well, things that ministers find interesting are not always of much interest to anyone else, but here goes anyway. Paul and his team had gone to Thessalonica. They told people there about Jesus. They had proclaimed that message of his life, his death, his resurrection, and people had received it, they'd accepted it, not merely as a human word, but as God's word. So, what's that all about? What's the difference? Think about how you might receive a message from a fellow human. It could be any message, but well, let's take as an example me saying, Jesus loves you, which is not a bad message, just messages go. You receive those words, something which you can consider, analyze. You might wonder, for example, if you believe that, should you believe that? You might wonder what would motivate me to say that. You might consider some evidence why it might be true or why it might not be true. And if you're a seriously deep and reflective kind of person, well, you might take some time to wonder, what difference would it make if that were true? How would that affect my life? But no matter how seriously you might take my message, it's still just a message, just some human words, just one person communicating some information, an opinion to another person. And no matter how much we might think about a message like that, it will still really only operate in our minds. So even if you trust me and believe in me and believe that what I say might be true, well, it might make you feel good, it might bring you a sense of comfort, that message, but on its own, it won't actually change anything. Now, compare that kind of word with the Word of God. Right back in the creation stories of Genesis, we're told that when God spoke, things happened. God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. No one thought about it. No one voted in favor of it. No one debated whether or not they agree with such a proposal. And just to prove there was no Church of Scotland around at the time, no one set up a committee to look into the idea. God's word was not a message. Rather, it was about action. It was about change. It was what made things happen. And later, in what we consider to be God's ultimate act of communication, he did not send a message to the world. He sent a person. As in the word of John's gospel, the word became flesh and lived among us. Jesus was not described as a messenger who brought the word of God or who spoke the word of God. He was the word of God, a living word who acted, who did things to bring about healing and transformation and new life. He described himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes, well, we can miss that point. We can think that the purpose of Christianity is to get people to believe Jesus, but Jesus never asked people to believe him. He asked people to have faith in him, to follow him, because he didn't bring a word from God for us to consider, think about, possibly agree with. No, he was the word of God to be honored and obeyed and trusted and followed. Can we begin to see then what Paul was talking about when he made that distinction between accepting something as a human word and accepting something as God's word? The Word of God is not a message to be considered and evaluated and accepted or rejected. The Word of God is a way of living, a way that brings about change and renewal. Our accepting it does not merely mean that we happen to agree with it, agree that it's true. No, our accepting it means that we start living our lives like that. So we can call the Bible the Word of God. We can study it. We can analyze it, we can find it marvelous or inspirational, all of which I hope we do, but that doesn't mean we're hearing the Word of God. For this Word is something that brings about change. It's, it's all about action, making things happen. So we could perhaps get a degree in biblical studies and we might or might not find it makes much of a difference to our lives, but 
when our lives demonstrate that we understand the primacy of love, when our actions demonstrate that we've grasped something of the power of forgiveness, when anyone could look at how we treat people and see the reality of compassion there, then we know we've heard the word of God. It's when we ourselves become channels of that divine love that we know we've heard the word of God. Human words might, well, they might point us in the direction of God's word, but they can never be the same thing. And human words, no matter how wise or how well constructed, can never have the impact that God's word carries. You see, some things, some things go deeper than words. Some things, some things are deeper than words. Some things go beyond anything we can communicate with words, which is why we humans have always had symbolic liturgical actions to keep us in touch with what really matters, to keep us in touch with God, to keep us in touch with the Word of God, which is what brings healing and growth and renewal within us, which is what leads us into hope-filled actions in our world. Mere words, they can never be enough, no matter how many of them we might use. No matter how well put together they might sound, mere words can never bring us what we really need. But the Word of God, well, that's something altogether different. May we indeed something which fascinates us in that. May it capture our hearts and change our lives and lead us into life in all its fullness. Shall we pray? Lord, our God, long ago, people of Scripture were sure of your presence with them through all that they faced as they journeyed into an unknown future. They knew how to rely on you for all they needed, trusting that you would provide for them, that you would bless them with all they need. So now we, in our time, similarly place our lives in your hands. We come trusting that you will uphold us in our journey, that you will feed us with your word, that you will clothe us with faith, that you will inspire us with a living hope. 
with thankful hearts, we rejoice in all your goodness towards us and the many blessings which we receive every day. We thank you for all the ways you provide for our needs as you accompany us along our way. We thank you for those physical gifts which sustain us, for fresh water piped into our homes, for food available on our tables, for shelter and for rest. As we give thanks for such good things that we enjoy, so also we bring our prayers for the world. We commend to your care all those who are in need in so many ways, in so many places. We pray for those whose lives must seem devoid of such blessing, who lack those basic things which we can so easily take for granted. We commend to your care those who are affected by war, by disaster, by conflict, those who lack food or water or medicine, shelter or rest. Help us to hear that eternal whisper of love calling us to respond to our neighbour's needs. Make us generous, open-hearted, compassionate people so that others may enjoy life in all its fullness. So now, in a moment of quietness, we bring before you our personal prayers, commending to your kindness and care those who are in our thoughts today. And as we call to mind those names and those faces, we remember also to pray for ourselves. Heavenly Father, we rejoice when you listen to our prayers. Those words that we are able to put together and the silent meditations of our hearts, we offer them all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with the Holy Spirit is glorified, one God, now and forever. Amen.
So may God the Father watch over you. May Christ the Son walk with you. May the Holy Spirit guard and guide you through this day and for evermore. Amen. We walk this way. We walk this way. We